Chapter 20. Alive to Color and Music While I am optimistic in my belief that music and color will eventually become the greatest agents for the healing of the sick and the sorrowing, yet I in no way underestimate the difficulties to be overcome before such a desired end can be fully realized. There are so many things to be taken into consideration, so much that at first cannot be otherwise than experimental that time must necessarily elapse before any system can be perfected. The music and color used to heal one man might prove, not only of no benefit to another, but irritating and possibly harmful in its effects. The question of temperament naturally would play an important part in all healing. What might prove one man's food might prove another man's poison. People are in different stages or degrees of development. Some people have outgrown and have no longer any use for the things that other people may still enjoy. In healing, then, the needs of the individual would have to be thoroughly studied and the effects of music and color upon each patient carefully noted. It is very doubtful whether music and color could be used, at first, to heal numbers of people at the same time, although later this might be accomplished, providing that the people were largely animated by the same desires and hopes so that there might be that unison necessary to the establishing of a receptive condition of mind. I have often been impressed when listening to the music of a great church organ with a sense of peace and serenity of mind, and a feeling that the cares and anxieties of life, for the time being, were all removed from me and really formed no part of my life. And sometimes, looking at the faces of those about me, I have been impressed by the thought that my own condition of mind was being also experienced by many others in the congregation. The musical church service, if of a good or high order, has always given me a greater spiritual uplift than any or all of the other services combined. I believe, however, that the best course to follow to demonstrate the healing value of music and color will first of all consist in individual treatment. If such treatment can once demonstrate its full value in a small way, then later it is bound to be taken up in the larger way. I think it most certainly might be made a very decided aid in the large institutions for the sick without going into the matter in a definite, scientific way. In such cases, however, it would be necessary to use good judgment in the selection of the music to be played. Music that would exhilarate without exciting, music with brightness and cheerfulness, and music that would quiet and soothe. It would be necessary to avoid music of an exciting nature, or any kind that was morbid or sad. I believe that one of the greatest mistakes being perpetuated in the hospital life of today is the use of white. White may be of the greatest value combined with color, but when the eye catches nothing but white in every direction, the tendency of white is toward excitement and not restfulness because the white wall reflects back at least 70% of light. I know that the underlying thought in the use of white is that of cleanliness and I am thoroughly convinced that the people who favor its use think that they are doing the wisest and best thing. A habit once established is difficult to get away from, whether it concern the lay mind, the semi-scientific, or the scientific. There is an underlying desire for permanency in everything that man does, and he hates to be pushed out of the beaten track. It would not be such a difficult matter for hospitals and other places where the sick are treated to do a little experimentation in the use of colors. Take two or more wards in a hospital, using white in one and green or light grays in the others. In connection with the gray, some little color might be used to brighten it up. If possible, have the same class of patients in all three wards, and then watch and see the different effects produced upon the patients. I am sure that the end of it would show that all white does not make as much for the health of the patients as is usually supposed. The eye needs color in order to satisfy the mind and the mind that is filled with monotony caused by its surroundings cannot make as satisfactory progress toward convalescence as the mind attuned, at least in a degree, to its outer environment. Many times have I heard people say that the white glare in the ward had made them almost distracted, for the awful feeling of monotony, day after day, made the hours seem days and the days seem weeks. Such a mental condition cannot conduce to rapid recovery. The white, too, of the ward is usually intensified by the number and size of the windows for the admission of light. If the room were a dark one, then there would be some real justification for the use of white. But surely with the great use of light, there should be something other than a white surface to absorb more of the light. Our hospitals and sanitariums have made very decided progress in many ways. 
Why not make a careful investigation as to the introduction of some color to satisfy the eye and discover whether color may not, even in a small way, prove beneficial in the healing of the sick? I do not underestimate the work of all kinds that has to be done in large hospitals, but sometimes even that which seems to be extra work may help make for an improved mental and physical condition, and instead of adding to, in reality lessen the work. If a state of restlessness in a patient or patients could be replaced by restfulness, it would not only act for the benefit of the patients, but for the nurses as well. Supposing, for instance, that curtains or draperies were used during the lightest hours of the day and were removed later, it would take time to do this, but might there not be a compensating gain in other ways? I can well understand that it would not be wise to keep such curtains and draperies up permanently because of their becoming infected with bacteria. That, I suppose, would be the chief medical objection to their use. But such an objection could be very easily overcome by occasionally subjecting them to heat or some other means that would destroy the bacteria. These are days of innovation and change. Too often the changes are not attended by the hoped for results. Nevertheless, that is no real reason why humanity should not try to overcome bad conditions with good ones, and go on from good to better, until the very best shall be obtained. Harmonious outer environment is certainly necessary for the well-being of those who are strong and whole. How much more necessary is it to those who are weak, to those experiencing pain and sorrow? Notwithstanding all the progress that has been made in the healing of the sick, I believe that not one half the attention is given that should be given to the production of harmonious environment for the sick and diseased, either in public or private institutions, or even in the homes of people. Sometimes a great deal of care is given to the question of temperature and food, without the slightest attention being paid to the things that attract the attention of the eye of the patient. In the healing of the sick, it will soon be acknowledged the world over that the mind is the greatest factor, and that, if it can be kept in a state of rest and hopeful expectation, much has been accomplished toward ultimate recovery. I do not wish the reader to assume that in what I have written I wish to be either fault-finding or antagonistic toward those in authority in our institutions of healing. My intention is rather to suggest ways and means that should prove beneficial alike to the patients and those in charge of them. Criticism that is solely antagonistic or destructive will never be productive of good. But one should never refrain from the criticism that points out the possibilities of new ways and methods of doing things better than they have been done. In the suggestion I have previously made, concerning colored curtains or draperies, I should like to modify my statement by saying that anything that would give the desired color necessary to the restfulness of the eyes would probably prove as effective and might not have to meet with the same objections. But that more color is needed in our institutions for the treatment of the sick is beyond all question, and I venture to say that the hospital that resorts to both music and color as an aid in the treatment of the sick will be more than repaid by the results. I am fully aware that in institutions generally the heads are loath to make any radical change and look with disfavor upon innovations that will in any way tend to disrupt the old order of things. The world is demanding new and better conditions of life, and our hospitals should seek to keep abreast of the times. Many of the greatest medical authorities realize that drug medication has had its day, that the healing of the sick will have to be accomplished by other ways and means. The psychology of the cause and cure of disease has been too much overlooked, and greater attention will have to be paid to it from this on. Surely there must be a thoroughly scientific method both for the prevention and the overcoming of disease, and when such a method is once fully established, then the body of people who are the professors or representatives of that system need have no fear of being displaced by any other system of practice carried on by outsiders. For their own preservation, the medical doctors should not decry or set aside any new effort looking toward a greater advancement for the healing of the sick. As it is at present, the exponents of the art of healing are divided into many camps, each possessing something that is good, but all lacking any full or complete system or method of healing. Innovations and changes must come, otherwise the present schools must go, because they do not by any means meet the full requirements of the age. The most successful healers, medical or otherwise, will be those who are most alert in their endeavors to seek out new and better ways, who are not content with simply accepting the old order of things, but will also ask that every new way or method shall be tested and proved, so that whatever is false or untrue may be discarded, and only the good remain. Many things may have a partial good that should not be cast aside, 
because they are more or less incomplete. The system of healing that is yet to come will not cast aside everything that has proven itself to be good in the past. It will only seek to add new good in every possible way, so that eventually the science of healing may be as sure and certain in its results as the other sciences of our day. I shall not attempt, in this book, to give any list either of vocal or instrumental music to be used for the healing of mind or body. In the chapter on color healing, one pointed out something of the analogy between sound and color, and I would say here that analogy between music and color would be safer to follow than any decided contrast between the two. Although, in certain cases, I can well understand how environment contrasting with musical sounds might prove of benefit. That, however, would have to be determined through experiment. But where the outer environment can be made to fully harmonize with the music, I think, in a great majority of cases, such conditions would prove the more successful. I believe that in a time to come, far more attention will be given to the prevention of disease than is paid to it at present. It is an old saying that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It is also a very wise saying, but not one to which people in general pay much attention. Consequently, the prevention of disease does not occupy the attention of the public mind to the degree it should. When anyone becomes irritable and easily disturbed mentally, it should be recognized that this shows some loss of vital energy, that something is wrong which should be made right. By this knowledge, weeks or even months of sickness might be saved. Nineteen times out of twenty the danger flags that tell of trouble ahead are up, but the individual pays little, if any, attention, and in the end he must pay the price of his heedlessness in sickness and pain. Sometimes, when tired and worn out in mind and body, a person, while not denying himself anything that his physical appetite calls for, will deny himself the pleasure of listening to good music for an hour or two, or of getting away to the park or the woods for entire change of thought because of the time and the expense involved in doing it. Frequently later, he has to pay the medical doctor many times the price of what might have prevented the sickness in the first place. We are all so constituted that we need a frequent change of thought and a certain amount of relaxation for health of mind and body, and if we are deprived of these, we suffer in consequence. But people are constantly establishing habits which, though they may seem to be good habits, often produce a fixed way of doing or living which gets them into ruts and eventually takes from them the real joy of living. We should keep our minds and bodies as elastic as possible, and this can never be done through a rigid way of thinking and acting. People should remember that stagnation means death, that the real goal set before us is that of constant progress, a continual influx of new ideas and adaptation to them, as well as a continual adjustment and readjustment to our environment. Gladstone was an embodiment of this, and through constant effort toward new thoughts and ideas and their outer application, he was able not only to do great work, but also to retain health and strength of mind and body to an advanced age. The man who is able to introduce something new into his life each day, something of a bright, uplifting nature, is not only using a preventive of disease, but is increasing his years on earth. The very worst thing in life that can happen to a man is to get into ruts or fixed ways of living, for in the doing of this he ceases to be his own master and becomes the slave of his own habits. Such a man is neither an inspiration to himself nor to anyone else. No matter how much work he may be accomplishing, he has little more of mind or soul than an automatic machine. And no matter how much of this world's goods he may accumulate, he will never be able to enter into the real enjoyment of them, and he frequently stands in the way of others who might enjoy life were it not for the undue pressure he brings to bear upon them. The ounce of prevention is much better than the pound of cure, but the ounce of prevention must be used if we are going to profit by it. The prevention of a morbid or a despondent mind is a much easier thing than its cure. The prevention of pain and disease of body will usually not take half the time that the cure takes. By renewing the mind and filling it with the real joy of life, with rhythm and melody, harmony and beauty, one may go on doing one's work, possibly increasing it day by day, and yet not wear out, because it is not work that wears us out, but the wrong way in which we do it. When we can put a joy into our work, the hours speed by rapidly, but when we work in a mechanical way, we watch the hours and the day is long. Will humanity never learn that there is a God-given way of doing everything and practice that way? Or must it go on indefinitely doing everything in the hardest possible manner? At present, civilized humanity lives either in the past or in the future, 
and gets little out of the present. Few people have made the discovery that the present offers to one all that one is capable of entering into and enjoying. And when once understood, one has really entered into the eternity of true living. The only thing that really concerns us is to know how to live today. And the living of today in the best way we know how will aid us when the morrow comes to a still better way of living. Life as we live it now is too often filled with unrealities, negative thoughts, and negative actions. What we need is to be alive in every part and to live life as the Almighty intended His children to live, in a free, joyous, happy way. Better be a beggar and be able to enter into the joys of nature, to feel attuned, as it were, to the world in which one lives, to enjoy the blueness of the sky, the green of the earth, and the color of the flowers, the beauty of the trees, to enter into and feel the heart throbs of nature than be the prince or the millionaire who has all the world can give and yet is not able to enjoy that which he has. Life is not a state for the mere accumulation of material riches, but a state of consciousness and anyone who is filled with the pure joy of life and is trying to impart it to the lives of others is in possession of the real riches and to him life is worth living. Humanity needs a tuning up to a higher key than that to which it is living. What is the use of living in the slums, surrounded by everything of a degrading nature? When one may live on the mountaintops, we can best fit ourselves for true living by bringing every refining influence to bear upon our lives. Music, poetry, painting, architecture, the best of drama, the literature of history, travel, romance, etc. In demanding the very best, we consequently get it. Through following such a course, the whole inner life is awakened and one begins to live. There is too much of the just existing to no particular end or purpose. It is better to make mistakes than to drift purposeless through life, for people often profit by their mistakes, but there is no profit in drifting. Life was intended to be lived every inch of the way from the lowest elemental savage to the fully developed saint. One should never be satisfied to go through life eating, drinking, sleeping, and being clothed. Such a life is profitless, being filled with no endeavor to be or to do, to become all that one wants to become, to do in the best possible way all that one desires to do. Fill the mind with creative desire, desire that has purpose and object in it, and then go confidently ahead and live the desires of heart and mind. The beauty of music and color may be made to fill the mind and the heart with high, true, pure desire. Why not use it to overcome the old habits, the old desires, the old obstacles that stand in the way of real accomplishment. We can overcome when we will to overcome. In the past, we have been satisfied to say that things are well enough, that we have no desire to improve upon them. Let us see that nothing is ever well enough, that new departures and new and better ways should constantly be entering into life, that when we have achieved one end, we have only fitted ourselves for still greater achievement. It is always through doing that we grow. And when the heart and mind are filled with a sense of the beautiful, then everything is going to be done in one's outer work in the most beautiful way. Life can bring to us whatever we will to have it bring. And it is the one who is rhythmic, melodious, and harmonious in action who will reap the strength, the beauty, and the perfection of life. In the study of life, we find a law of contradiction. In logic, when the absolute truth of any theory is ascertained, then anything which in any way contradicts that truth is held to be false or untrue. In our everyday life, we lose sight of logic and, consequently, go on believing many things to be true and believing their contradictories to be true also. In our everyday life, hate seems to be as true as love, doubt as real as faith, despair as real as hope, disease as real as health, sorrow as real as joy, death as real as life and we might go on indefinitely enumerating these contradictions of life, love, and truth. Mankind is not three et able to see all this in its true light, if love, faith, and hope, etc., constitute having the realities of life, then whatever contradicts them must of necessity be false and untrue. To a degree, people see this, but only in the most limited way. No one, unless he were very ignorant, would affirm the reality of darkness. He might say that darkness had an existence, but its existence was wholly dependent on the absence of light, and at any minute by the turning on of the light, the darkness would vanish. Neither would anyone claim that ignorance was something in and of itself, 
but would tell you that with the coming of knowledge the ignorance would be dispelled, that ignorance simply indicated a lack, and with the supply of that lack, ignorance would cease to exist. That which is true concerning one contradictory is, from first to last, true of all contradictories. The introduction of truth into the mind eventually dispels everything that contradicts it. One of the most important things to which I would call attention is that man's life on this earth, from first to last, is a process of overcoming. A New Testament writer says, The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. There is also a promise made in the book of Revelation, He that overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. We overcome darkness with light. We overcome ignorance with knowledge. We overcome hate with love, and so on. All the way through life we encounter unreal states of consciousness in order to replace them with real ones. Now, music was given to us to help us overcome all the unrealities of life in the easiest and best way. Wherever true rhythm is lacking, music supplies it. Wherever melody is lacking in the life, music brings it. Where discord exists, harmony overcomes it. The sick, the diseased, and the sorrowing are all out of tune. Their conditions are as unreal as any of the contradictories of life that we have just enumerated. All such conditions, whether of mind or of body, have an existence but have no reality. Why should the wild animal creation be almost entirely free from disease, while with man diseases go on multiplying? The superior knowledge possessed by man should do more for him than the very limited intelligence or instinct of the animals. And yet we find quite the reverse of this is true. The founder of Christianity once said, If your eye be single, your whole body shall be full of light. The eye has not yet become single and mankind is living a double life. Part of his life is that of a god and the other phase is that of a devil. At one moment he acts one part, and at another he may be acting the other part. The godlike man is positive in his thought, harmonious in his actions. He is a creative man, always doing, always accomplishing, ever pushing forward toward the light, inspired from within by the universal spirit. But when he loses this consciousness he reverts to what he was in the past, and for the time being comes under the control of all the old passions of his former elemental life. We say he loses his temper, but the condition is a reversal to a temper that controlled him possibly in a distant past. All the elemental activities of his animal nature come into the ascendant, and man in this condition is a devil incarnate. Instead of being creative, he is destructive. Instead of being courageous, he is fearful. Instead of living the positive life, he is living a life that is made up of negatives. This is the life that has to be so fully overcome that it will be impossible for the man ever to revert to it or be controlled by it again. This is the life that music and color and harmony of beauty as the light bearers of truth are to overcome. We give reality to all the old consciousness, but the truth is not in it. The old, the partial, the incomplete must be superseded by a consciousness of the divine that makes for perfect self-control. When the full consciousness comes, then that which is in part shall be done away. Man is the son of God, having dominion and power over, not only his own life, but all things. He has not yet reached in his consciousness the fulfillment of this, but he has, in some cases, felt the prophecy of it and in a confident, expectant way is looking forward to the time when he shall realize the full measure of true manhood, when he shall have passed from death unto life to the glorious liberty of a son of God. Rhythm, melody, harmony, and beauty combining in the life will make it godlike, will free it from sin, pain, and disease, will bring to life the joy that shall dispel the sorrow, the light that shall overcome the darkness, the love that shall overcome the hate. Then, through the silence overhead, an angel with a trumpet said, Forevermore, forevermore, the reign of violence is over. And like an instrument that flings its music on another strings, the trumpet of the angel cast upon the heavenly lyre its blast, and on from sphere to sphere the word re-echoed down the burning chords, Forevermore, forevermore, the reign of violence is over, this will regenerate and beautify not only man's inner life, but also his outer world. For as man grows into a knowledge of love and wisdom, as he realizes all the rhythm and color of life, he will beautify his outer world so that the desert shall be made to blossom as the rose. 
The time is near at hand when all this shall come to pass. All lovers of music and of color can hasten the coming of the new time by doing everything within their power to interest and impress others with this vital necessity for music, with the vital necessity for beauty, until at last the whole earth shall sing its new song, and life shall have gained its triumphant victory over death and the grave. Then the ears and the soul of man will have become attuned to the celestial and eternal music of the spheres. Then there shall be no more night, neither shall there be any more sorrow, for God shall wipe away all tears, and to his name shall be attributed all honor and glory forever and ever. End of chapter